Okay, I have 6.30 on the clock. And Liz, we're good to go, correct? Yes. All right, well, welcome everyone to the, it's turned into an annual event, the Memory and Mobility Program Update um, with some of your favorite and most talented scientists from the Hudson Alpha Institute. We have almost 200 people on this Zoom webinar. And we are delighted that you've decided to spend a few minutes with us this evening. And we think that you will find that time very worthwhile um, when you hear from everyone who's, uh, who's gonna be speaking. So before we get started, um, and I should introduce myself, I'm Elizabeth Heron. I'm part of the advancement team and um, support the Hudson Alpha Foundation. We wanna thank everyone who has supported the memory and mobility program over the years. It has made a tremendous difference in what these very talented scientists are able to do. Um, and we just thank you so much for that support. Um, tonight, I wanna to say a special sponsor to, or a special thank you to our sponsor, Thompson Gray. Um, they are a presenting sponsor for this event, and we are very grateful um, that, that, that they stepped up and uh, agreed to be our sponsor. So thank you, Thompson Gray. Um, you're going to hear from, um, of course, Rick Myers, who is the president, science director, and the MA Loya chair of genomics at Hudson Alpha, as well as Brian Roberts, Lindsay Rizzardi, and Nick Cochran. Um, and Rick will be introducing them soon. So. Um, you know, we want to be in person. Please know how much we miss seeing you all in person. I think next year we will absolutely be doing this in person again. We were just talking about that before we started the webinar, how much we, we miss seeing people. Um, but for right now, we felt like uh, when we needed to make the decision to do this program and we've, we've been error, erroring on the side of caution all along with the pandemic that we needed to, um, to do this one via a Zoom webinar. So um, uh, you all know that what Hudson Alpha has been very involved in the COVID-19 response, but we have also stayed very involved in all of the other types of research at Hudson Alpha. And Rick, I'm gonna turn it over to you and ask you, how have we been managing at Hudson Alpha um, since COVID-19 with our other types of research like neurological disease? Well, we, we were fortunate that we slowed down a little bit the first month of the pandemic, but we're able to come back and work in the laboratory. A lot of the work that we do uh, also involves computational, uh, bio, computational work and, and data analysis and interpretation and writing up results and, and submitting them, et cetera. And so uh, we really didn't slow down very much. There was, there was a little bit of a slowdown at the beginning. Fortunately, we've been able to keep that going. And we've made a lot of progress in this, uh, in this last year, year plus that we're, we're talking about. Well, we're going to just give you a tiny, well, not a tiny taste, a small taste of, of, of that, because we're not going to be able to cover everything, but we thought we would cover a, a few of the topics with these three uh, senior scientists uh, um, uh, presenting some about them as well. <clears throat> Wonderful. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic that Hudson Alpha has been able to continue doing their work in light of the pandemic um, and also contribute to the COVID-19 response. But why don't we jump right in? And Rick, why don't you start us off and tell us some of those things that have been happening in neurological disease research, please. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Also, let me just add my thanks to everyone. This is the, the um, people who have helped support us um, uh, with donations have made a huge difference in our ability to do this. I mean, it, we write grants, we get funding. In fact, your funding helps us get additional funding uh, in grants and foundation awards and things. It's, uh, research takes a lot of effort. These three are not the only three doing this. It's a big group of people who are really devoted to neurological disease research. And, and so uh, I, I, uh, this, this has meant all the world to us. So thank you so much. And I wanna, I wanna make sure you all know that. All right, I'm gonna try to share my screen. We'll see if that works. I also will apologize if you hear a little dog whimpering in the background, he's here. Uh, with me. I'm babysitting tonight. So, okay. Can you all see this slide? Some, somebody who I can hear say yes. Okay, good. Yes. Um, so this is, uh, as Liz, that's, this is what we're doing. We're updating for the memory and mobility program. And I'm just going to do a little introduction uh, before I, uh, before we have the folks um, in our, uh, in our group now. I'm not sure how I move it forward. Let me 
Slide. Rick, while you're working on that, let me just interject and say that um, we are going to take questions at the end of the presentation. We're going to let everyone present their, um, their work. And so if you have a question, you can put it in the chat window um, and you can do that at any time, but we're going to get to them um, at the end of the presentations and, uh, and Rick and the team will answer them. So just want to let you all know that. Thank you. Go ahead, Rick. Elizabeth, is it the chat window or the Q&A window? Make sure that I'm not sure which ones they can get to, but just- I think it's the chat window. Okay, good. Good. Yep. Sorry. Okay. So let me just get, do a little introduction. So we work on uh, six, seven, uh, no, eight of these diseases, excuse me, um, uh, uh, ALS, Huntington disease, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson. But we also started projects uh, not too long ago called CBD or CBS, cortical basal syndrome, FTD, which is related a little bit similar to Alzheimer's. Nick may mention a little bit about that. And a, a similar uh, disorder called PSP. Uh, sadly, there are probably six or 650, 600 or 650 um, different neural, neurodegenerative diseases. Many of them are very rare, fortunately. Some of them are not, as you know about Alzheimer's and even some of the other ones here that are not so rare. We do, we, we're we taking three, well, really four approaches, three general approaches that were in, the pro, in progress. One we will not talk about tonight, Brian may mention it, but is to develop blood tests. What if you can take blood and see whether somebody has onset, or uh, sorry, who has the disease before they have onset of symptoms. Uh, that uh, This is similar to PSA for prostate cancer or even looking at genes involved in breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Those are biomarkers that might tell you before you have symptoms. Uh, and that can be very, very useful for the, the patients, the families, the physicians, but also really important for drug development and monitoring treatment. So we're not going to talk about that tonight, we, but I will say, and I'm very proud, I'm very happy about this, we're doing that for, uh, for ALS and Alzheimer's disease, particularly now, uh, starting to do it on the, the other diseases as well, and we, we are making real progress on that. Uh, and you'll hear about that later uh, in, a, in a subsequent day. Um, this is a, a real sciencey sounding thing, but figuring how, how does genes that when they're mutated cause disease, how they are controlled, how they're regulated, what turns them on and off. And the reason that's important, and you will hear about this tonight, is that we really want to be able to shut off the genes when they're the ones that cause toxic uh, proteins to build up. And that's what causes some of these neurodegenerative diseases. It's a complicated thing, but we're making, this is something we've been studying for years and years. I really started studying even in graduate school ages ago, uh, how genes are turned on and off. And you'll hear about that mostly from Brian, but a little bit from, well, and also from Lindsay, but a little bit even from Nick. And then um, another area is discovering the causes of these. And usually it turns out genes are involved in this, sometimes single genes, Huntington disease is caused by a single gene but very useful if we can find new genes that have not been found yet because they be, they're really important for understanding the disease, for doing diagnosis, and really, really important for developing new targets for drugs. We need, new, we need drugs for these, for these diseases. Almost none of them work or they don't work very well in the cases where they do. And so this is a really important part of, of the research in this area. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm now going to pass it over to senior scientist Brian Roberts, and I'm going to control the slides, so he'll be asking me to go to the next one. So here's a, a photo of handsome Brian, and now we will go to the first his first slide. Thanks, Rick. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody uh, here today in attendance for their continued support of the work we're doing at Hudson Alpha, and also for this opportunity to talk about some of the research that I'm really passionate about. And, one of the things I spend almost all of my time on, uh, at least a good portion of it, is studying Huntington's disease. Uh, and, I, and I realize that maybe Huntington's disease isn't as commonly known as some of the other ones, so I'll, I'll spend some time explaining it. First, over here on, on the right, I have this, this bar plot that is showing the number of cases of common neurodegenerative diseases per year in the United States. Um, and so you can see that Alzheimer's disease really dwarfs the other ones as being you know, far more common than any of the other uh, major neurodegenerative diseases with, with Parkinson's being up there and ALS as well. And then Huntington's disease may not even be able to see it as a small bar here on the, on the right, as it's fairly rare compared to these other diseases. But given the severity of Huntington's disease 
and the uh, detrimental impacts it has not only on patients but also their families. Uh, this incidence is is still uh, is still very significant and is an unmet medical need uh, that we want to to help address. Um, so, going over the symptoms of, of Huntington's disease, one of the very first symptoms uh, shown here by um, this person with some tremors is something called chorea. So, chorea comes from the Latin for dancing. Um, and Huntington's patients early on in their disease progression exhibit characteristic arm and, and leg movements that to early physicians resembled uh, a dance of sorts. And the disease actually used to be called Huntington's chorea until they, they changed it to disease. Um, and Huntington's disease very insidiously just causes an atrophy of the brain. Uh, so up here is a sort of cartoon depiction of a normal brain. And then uh, below it is an HD brain. Uh, and you can see that the brain has actually begun to shrunk. Now that shrinkage occurs in that very middle region, which you can see is, is starting to disappear faster than the rest. That region in the brain is associated with motor function, the control of the body. And so that is why the initial symptoms are, are motor symptoms. Um, but those aren't the only symptoms that patients uh, uh, have as the disease progresses. It eventually moves to affect cognition, memory, um, there are psychological impairments associated with this, uh, and the disease eventually advances till the patients succumb to the disease and die. Um, usually the disease onsets around age 40, and so that's a lot different than other neurodegenerative diseases, which usually affect people older than that. Uh, and part of the reason that it's such a scourge is that it affects people while they're still young, maybe still have young children, um, and they uh, begin to decline very rapidly. Um, the, the disease is uniformly fatal. Uh, everyone who gets it will die from it. Um, and usually they, people live about 10 to 20 years after onset with the last part of those years being spent in um, you know, a very uh, managed care situation because they can't do much for themselves. Sadly, currently there are no effective treatments. And how Huntington's differs really dramatically in terms of its genetics from these other diseases that I'm presenting here is how it's inherited. Um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, they do have genetic components. Um, there are some forms of them that are inherited very um, strongly in families. For the most part, those are sporadic diseases. Those are diseases which everyone here has roughly equal risk of getting. There are, again, modifiers that can change that risk, but for, for the most part, we all have about the same risk of getting Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS. That is not true for Huntington's disease. Most people who are listening to me right now have zero risk for getting Huntington's because if your father or your mother did not have Huntington's, you have zero risk for getting it. However, if your father or mother did have it, you have a 50% chance of inheriting Huntington's. And if you do inherit it, you will get the disease and you will succumb to it. Um, because of that inheritance pattern, Huntington's disease is really a disease of families. It wreaks havoc on families because they have seen a parent go through the disease and they know that they're at risk for getting it. And so this causes all sorts of problems in families even before any symptoms begin. Uh, next slide. So the good news is that we actually know exactly how Huntington's is caused, what, what drives the disease. Um, it is caused by a gene called the Huntington gene and is named HTT. And that's because the people discovered it looking for this cause of Huntington's disease. In fact, it was discovered in 1993 uh, by a group, uh, a, a consortium of Huntington's researchers. And actually some of the work that Rick did uh, on the Human Genome Project helped point them in the right direction to look for where that gene was. Uh, and so what they found is that in the Huntington gene, there's a series of base pairs, the CAG. Uh, and in healthy people, they have a repeat of those, but that repeat is always 38 repeats or less. And the disease associated version of the gene the repeat is greater than 40 base pairs. And if you have greater than 40 CAG repeats, you are guaranteed to, to develop the disease. Actually, what we now also understand is that as the patient ages in that approximate 40 year time span, this CAG expands in their cells through a somewhat still mysterious process. And actually that very expanded form of the gene, which can be hundreds of CAGs, is actually probably the cause of the gene. And some of this mechanism about this expansion was actually really nicely described by Dr. Jacob Loop, who is a senior scientist in Rick's lab as well. And he published this paper with his previous lab before coming here. One of the things he, he found, 
and is a, a great mystery of Huntington, is that this expansion, which we believe causes the disease, only happens in two tissues in the human body. It happens in liver, and there are no known associated problems with Huntington patient's liver. And it happens in a small little region of the brain called the putamen. And the putamen is exactly the tissue that first atrophies in Huntington's and is the source of those motor, uh, uh, motor disturbances. So it is clearly related to the disease progression. Nobody on the planet understands why the CAG gets longer in putamen and liver and no other organ. And it is, it is an area of a lot of research. Oh, Next slide. <laughs> All right. But the goals of our research at Huntington in terms of, of Huntington's disease are, are twofold. Um, the first one, as Rick mentioned, is the second point here is we wanna identify things in blood that we can use to measure and track the progression of Huntington's disease. Um, this could be useful in monitoring a therapeutic. Um, and you could see if the therapeutic is working uh, on a short time scale rather than having to wait you know, 10 to 20 years to see if the patient's disease progression has changed. Um, and I really enjoy biomarker research. I, I love both of my research children equally, but today I'm gonna to focus more on uh, the, the Huntington gene and how we're, we're trying to figure out how to turn it off. So it's, in some ways, this is a basic research endeavor where we're trying to fundamentally figure out how the Huntington gene is turned on in tissues and specifically, of course, in the brain. And the main reason we're trying to do that is so we can figure out how to turn it off. Uh, and we think this is an area that we're uniquely capable of, of doing because uh, Rick's lab is a world expert in gene regulation as part of a, a consortium called ENCODE, which operates in labs all across the country. We have developed a great deal of expertise in understanding how genes are turned on. So it seemed natural to us to try to apply that expertise to the HTT gene so that we can then try to figure out how to turn it off. And the good news is, is that a lot of research indicates that you can either turn off or maybe turn down the expression of HTT, the Huntington gene, in human beings. And that actually doesn't hurt the people because it might be, it could have been that the HTG gene was doing something very important in people and turning it off would hurt them. But it actually turns out that you could do that in human beings and you might slow down the disease progression. Uh, next slide. So this is a model here and I'll explain it and don't worry about all the names I, I left in here about what these things are called. Um, this is a model about how we initially thought the Huntington worked, how Huntington gene expression worked, how it was controlled. And the reason we thought this is this is because all everybody thought it was controlled. Uh, this is sort of a standard model of gene expression. Uh, the main area I want you to look at here is this area called the promoter. And the promoter is just a fancy name for where the gene starts. This is just where the gene starts in the genome. And it turns out there's, it's a very important part of the gene in terms of turning it on and off. Uh, and at the promoter, the gene is then transcribed, which is how the gene is turned on by this complex here. And this piece of, of RNA here will go on to make the protein that makes the Huntington gene. But this, the model that we were working with was that there are other regions of the genome near the Huntington promoter. And we can think of the genome as a piece of string and if you take a piece of string, you can take two parts that are far apart from each other on the string and you can loop them together in space and they'll be close to each other in space. Well, we believed that that's how the Huntington gene is regulated, that a region that is far down the string of the genome actually was being brought in to close proximity to the beginning of the Huntington gene. And that was the main way that the gene was regulated. Um, as an aside, I just wanted to point out that it's been in the, uh, the press a lot that there was a, a clinical trial for a potential treatment of Huntington's disease by this large big pharma company called Roche and this smaller biotech called, called Ionis. And they had developed a drug that was designed to turn off Huntington. It was designed to do exactly what we are trying to do ourselves with our research. And the way it did it was by targeting what's called the mRNA. It's just a different step in the way that the Huntington gene is turned on. Unfortunately, the trial was discontinued because it wasn't working. And I don't want that to discourage people because there's a whole lot of different reasons why clinical trials fail. And some of them have nothing to do with the underlying biology. It has to do with just how the clinical trial was designed or sometimes how the drug was being delivered. But it certainly was disappointing to the Huntington community to find that that drug was not working. But again, just shows why 
we need to have multiple approaches to the same problem because any one of those approaches can fail at any point during the process. And we need to have other ways in, in, in the works for how we can address that. Uh, next slide. So this is my last slide. Um, what we've learned about how the Huntington gene is regulated is that it's much more complicated than the original model that we had proposed. So Huntington is in something we call a transcription factory. And um, that may sound like a funny term, but actually it's a, it's a, it's a entity that's been known for maybe 30 years. And essentially what it is, it's a region in the nucleus where a lot of genes are turned on and they're all brought into close proximity to each other. So in this cartoon here, I've tried to show you that this might be where the Huntington gene is. And then this is a lot of other genes and they're all together in this red blob here that we call a transcription factory. So instead of being like a string where we've taken two ends and brought them closer together, this is honestly more like a tangle of a fishing line that you might find in a tackle box that's been left around for a while. So it's gonna require us a lot of effort to sort all this out and figure out what's going on. And in fact, I, I drew this transcription factory here as a big red blob. And that's not because I was trying to simplify this to explain to you. It's because we don't really know what's in there. The field that doesn't know what's in there. Uh, and so we've got some work to do to define what a transcription factory is and how that might relate to being able to turn off Huntington expression. Uh, and so with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Rick. So uh, thank you, Brian. L let me add one thing to that, that one reason why uh, uh, <clears throat> this discovery is important, this was a lot of work by, by Brian, led by Brian, but uh, others in the group as well, is that let's say you do figure out how to turn off the Huntington gene. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but I'm pointing to that, let's call that the Huntington gene. Because it's in this blob here, it might affect all the other genes as well. And that could be bad. That could cause some side effects or make it not even work at all. So, so we're not discouraged by this. This is actually kind of an important discovery. It fits with some things that other people have learned about other genes. Uh, but it, it, yeah, sometimes I would, we're not calling this a failure. It's saying go in this direction uh, with the same goal that we had before. I just wanted to add that. So. Yeah, and if I could just add one thing, I know I've gone long, but as, as you mentioned, Rick, getting from that slide to the next slide is the work of you know 10 people uh so it was a, it was a lot of effort um and uh we usually have an acknowledgement slide we don't have time today but i just want people to be aware that a lot of people contributed to this work great thanks Brian. all right let's I, I you may have questions hold them please or put them in the chat chat function uh chat window but let's hear from lindsay rizardi she's going to tell you about some just amazing new technology that's almost seems like science fiction go lindsay <laughs> Thanks, Rick. And thank you, everyone, for allowing me to be here today. I'm very excited to talk to you and share with you some of the work we've been doing to harness single cell technologies for neurodegenerative research at, at Hudson Alpha. Slide. So why should we study single cells? Well, we're all aware that tissues are composed of many distinct cell types. And in the brain, the major cell types that we have are different kinds of neurons as well as different types of glial cells or support cells. And each one of these unique cell types has its own set of genes that are turned on or off. And so each cell type has a unique transcription program and these genes can be regulated differently in different cell types. Uh, click please, Rick. And when we have um, a disease tissue, like in a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's, we also have the complication of uh, faulty gene expression or the wrong genes being turned off or on in cells that are in the process of degenerating or in the cells like glial cells that are responding to that, gen that degeneration or stress response. And so when we look at a whole tissue, when we're comparing uh, patient samples or comparing control samples to disease patients, we have this entire complicated mess of cells that are each generating different signals. And when we're just looking at bulk tissue, we can't tell if the genes that we're seeing being dysregulated or inappropriately turned off or on are coming from um, one cell type, all the cell types, or just the degenerating cells. And so this is where the single cell technologies can really provide some wonderful insights to us. Slide. So how are we at Hudson Alpha applying this technology? So we have, as part of an NIH-funded study, um, we're looking at um, 
comparing tissues between control patients and Alzheimer's patients. And if you'll click Rick, well, isolating single cells and click again. And uh, in identifying each one of these different cell types within the brain and then comparing them, um, each single cell type to the other in control versus disease. And in this way, we can start to compare which cells are the ones that are specifically being affected by disease. And this is very similar to what Brian was telling us about how Huntington's disease, that expansion is only affecting a specific brain region, the putamen, whereas in Alzheimer's disease, it could be just a single cell type that's being affected, such as microglia, which we know to be really important for Alzheimer's disease. So this gives us a really powerful system to interrogate um, how genes are turned off and on and how this is, is disrupted in disease. A slide. And so this is a, a pilot study that we've already begun. And this is some of the very first data that we've generated in the lab. And again, I just wanna emphasize that this technology is extremely new and it's, it's moving very, very quickly. And it's allowing us to have so many insights into, into various diseases, not only Alzheimer's, but we're also planning future experiments to compare with um, ALS, with Parkinson's, FTD, all sorts of other neurodegenerative diseases. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment. But this is the type of data that we're generating. So what we're looking at here is um, a plot of about 64,000 cells that we've isolated from those eight donors. So we have four Alzheimer's patients and four control samples, and we've isolated 64,000 cells from these tissues. And in the colors represent different cell types that we've isolated. And you can see that we've got representation across many different cell types that are found in the brain. For instance, in the blue, you'll see different shades of blue that indicate different distinct populations of excitatory neurons, for instance. And in purple, we see microglia. Again, this is a cell type that's been implicated in Alzheimer's in the past. So all of this diversity is present in, in a bulk tissue. And what we can do now that we've isolated these distinct populations and we can take oligodendrocytes, for instance, in, in the pink and say, you know, Let's compare the oligodendrocytes from a control sample to an Alzheimer's disease sample and figure out which genes are incorrectly turned on or off. And that can give us some insights because those genes in that cell type may be different than those that are aberrantly turned on or off in microglia, for instance. And in this way, we can dissect the different regulatory mechanisms that are, that are disrupted in disease. Uh, click, please, Rick. Another issue when you're looking at, at whole tissues is not only do you have a diversity of cell types, but you also have diversity in the proportions of those cell types within a tissue sample. Um, for instance, if you'll look at the control sample, the second control sample that's got a ton of yellow, that means that that piece of tissue that we were looking at had a huge proportion of oligodendrocytes. And that's different from tissue to tissue. And so if you were just comparing a bulk piece of tissue that, that we didn't isolate single cells from, what you'd really be looking at is mostly the signal from the oligodendrocytes. And if for instance, it's the microglia that are really important, you might not be able to see that signal from that tissue unless you isolate the microglia. So in this way, we're able to look very closely and pinpoint exactly the cell type and exactly the gene in that cell type that is disrupted in disease. And this is allowing us to have um, a greater insight into, into mechanisms and it can help us identify new targets and new cell types that need to be targeted for any uh, therapeutics for interventions. Slide, please. So as I mentioned previously, our goal for this work, again, this is a pilot study in Alzheimer's, but our ultimate goal is to continue this study, expand our Alzheimer's samples and include as well other neurodegenerative uh, samples from ALS patients and Parkinson's disease patients to try to identify or, or determine if there are common genes and cell types involved in general neurodegenerative diseases. We think that there may be a common signature of neurodegeneration in a given population of cell or a given cell type. Oops, the lights just went out, apologies. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, uh, we could also identify um, genes or cell types that are unique to a specific disease. Again, I keep bringing up microglia for Alzheimer's because we know how important a cell type is. And that could be a unique feature of Alzheimer's, whereas microglia may or may not be as involved in ALS. And so we would be able to identify that from this type of study because we will have um, isolated those very specific cell populations and been able to see how genes are, um, are misregulated in those cell types. 
So with that, um, I'll pass it back to Rick. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay. Let me just uh, add one little, oops, uh, go, let me go backwards here. One little, little thing. Uh, let me go back to the, <laughs> look at the cortex there. That's a, that's a human brain and the cortex region, at least in Alzheimer's, that's where a lot of the, dam most of the damage occurs, or at least the initial. Um, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but our bodies have something like 34 trillion different cells and the brain has several trillion. So that's a lot of cells. When you take a, a postmortem sample for that and don't do the single cell separation, you're we're probably usually doing those experiments, Lindsay, in mm -hmm. millions of cells, right? If we don't, yes. until we separate. So this separation is a way of getting in incredible resolution, exquisite detail down to the single cell for all the reasons that Lindsay said. That's really important. We're so excited about this. And I will say, um, again, thank you to all of you uh, and, and our, our donors, because this required some new equipment that we didn't have. And we used the funds from the M&M Fund to be able to start these experiments. Uh, I think we bought the equipment a, a couple of years ago. The, the technology is really new I'm and here. continuing to advance. So. so thank you, Lindsay, wonderful, thank you. Now, <clears throat> Nick Cochran, before I uh, introduce Nick, a lot of you've met him because he, he uh, and I and others uh, have talked multiple times. I will say Nick's a senior scientist in the laboratory. Uh, he was at this stage where he was ready to look for a faculty position and. That he did, and one of the places he looked uh, was Hudson Alpha, as well as other places. And we are very fortunate because he had multiple opportunities that he accepted our offer to be a faculty member. So he'll be building his own lab starting, I think, September 1 this year. And you all have helped, and I hope will continue to help to support our growing neurodegenerative, well, neurological disease, uh, but neurodegenerative mostly research. So Nick, I'm gonna leave it to you to start your, uh, your presentation. Thank you, and good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you, Rick, for that introduction, and um, as Rick said, um, you know, I'm very excited um, to be continuing uh, here at, at Hudson Alpha in a, in a faculty role um, to grow our efforts in neurodegeneration, and it's, uh, this is not a taboo thing, so it's a little bit weird in science, because um, when you get to a certain career stage, you're actually encouraged to go out and interview other places, and part of it is, is uh, um, you know, learning about um, other places, and then and then part of it is is talking about the important work that's going on at each place at other places, and then that grows the science network, and and um, you know, so that's a, a good thing. Um, but uh, I am very excited um, to have the opportunity to continue here um, and uh, be able to keep uh, keep going with the amazing work um, that's happening in this area. So you heard from Brian about um, particular efforts on a particular gene on understanding its regulation or how it's turned on and off. And of course, um, the human genome has about 20,000 genes. Um, many of those are relevant for neurodegenerative disease. So we're starting um, with the, the top list. And one of the things that my lab will do is do similar types of, of work for other genes associated with neurodegeneration. Um, you heard uh, Lindsay talk about um, emerging technologies um, that we're developing. And Lindsay is really on the cutting edge. I, I, I think uh, it's important to state that there are only a few labs in the country that are really doing um, work at this level on the, the type of technology um, that, uh, that Lindsay is working with, along with others in the lab. Um, so this is really on the, on the um, really cutting edge of uh, technology for the field and especially applied to human tissues. It, it's very exciting. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit and move from gene regulation, which I, I work on gene regulation projects as well. Um, to talking about um, discovery of genetic changes and how those can be associated with disease or things uh, related to disease. So to start out, I've, I've talked about this project before for those of you who, um, uh, who have been on before or, or the general collaboration before, uh, not this particular project, but um, we have been working for a long time now with a group um, out of Columbia that um, has a patient population that includes the largest um, Autosomal dominant, you know, Brian described that, where uh, disease runs in a family, and this time for a rare form of Alzheimer's disease that runs in a family. Um, so they have the largest family like this in the world in this, uh, in this biobank in Columbia and then this medical center. Um, they also have uh, people who are not from that family who we've done projects on as well. Um, and this, this region of Columbia has a very unique population structure that's also um, informative for the genetics. So Rick, if you'll advance the slide, please. 
What I'd like to talk about is, is a really interesting project, and this is so unique because of this unique, very large family, uh, on uh, an attempt to discover age of onset genetic associations for this dominant Alzheimer's disease family. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, this family, these um, individuals develop Alzheimer's disease in their 40s. So you can see that the, the median age, the typical age for developing Alzheimer's disease in this large extended family is about 48 years old. So it's, a, it's an atypical form of Alzheimer's um, where the onset is, is quite early and that's the only pathology contributing. So many times you think about Alzheimer's, um, there may be things like um, you know lots of other factors and aging um, that can contribute to eventually developing a dementia phenotype. But in this case, it's very driven by that core Alzheimer's pathology. Um, so what's particularly interesting about this population is despite this very strong uh, genetic cause that leads to dementia in these individuals, there's a subset, a small number of these individuals that have uh, dementia onset much later on. Um, so in their um, late 50s, even 60s or 70s. Um, you may be familiar with this from a, there's a New York Times um, article and, and a very prominent paper about one individual. That individual is in this study as well. Um, that's the oldest age of onset at around age 75 um, for dementia. And what's really great about the study that we're doing here is that we not only have the genetic information from that individual, but from all of these 344 individuals um, across the age spectrum, including um, many others with a later age of onset. So why is this important? Um, what we're trying to do here is find genetic changes that may be associated with this very late age of onset. So we can find genes um, that are affected in some way. They may be very good drug targets um, because that could help to delay the disease in, in other populations as well. Uh, so Rick, if you'll advance the slide. Just to show the, the way that this works. So there's, again, this unique family, this large extended family, and we actually know the family structure. So this is the family tree of that large family. And you can see that we've um, color coded the age of onset. So we can look into the, the different individuals in this family and um, look at their underlying genetics and try and find these genetic associations with a later age of onset. Um, and that's what we're currently in the process of doing. In fact, we've done this analysis. We found some interesting things. And now we've started up new collaborations that we're leading with other very prominent groups in the field that have other cohorts that don't have as many people as this, um, but are similar. So there's an effort in the US that has a couple of hundred individuals with early onset Alzheimer's disease from smaller families. Um, and that's gonna be a, a source of uh, replication. We talk about replication analysis and genetics where you wanna see something in multiple groups. And then that gives us a, a high level of confidence. So um, this has turned into a, a big multi-center collaboration um, that Hudson Alpha is leading on is all possible um, because this entire project was supported by um, memory and mobility uh, program um, fundraising efforts. Um, so we, we could not have done it um, without, without that support. Rick, if you'll advance the slide. The next thing that I'll talk about is then what does that lead to? You know, of course it leads to a great study um, and a, a big collaboration that we're gonna hopefully gain some really valuable scientific insights from. Um, what it can also lead to is additional funding that doesn't have to be driven by philanthropy, but it can be driven by foundations or the NIH. And that's the case um, for this as well. So this led to new collaborations um, with groups all over South America. This is um, led by Augustine Ibanez, but there are site uh, coordinators at multiple places in all of the countries that you see on your screen. Um, and this is funded by multiple uh, different organizations, including um, government NIH funding. And um, as a part of this, the sites are collecting detailed clinical information on um, all of these uh, individuals they're going to study and Hudson Alpha is doing the genetics. This is, uh, you know, again, led to lots of new collaborations and uh, will lead to a lot of uh, interesting discoveries down the road in these underrepresented populations that it's so important um, to right size the contribution of genetics. Um, so that's uh, my update for where we're at with you know, the, the genetic association studies and discovery of how genes are contributing to these diseases. And that's another important avenue of uh, this type of research here at Hudson Alpha. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so uh, let me just reiterate, Nick explained that well, but I wanna just reiterate by finding, uh, if there are genes that make you resistant, uh, maybe they still get the disease, but much later, imagine, you know, 20, 30 years more of life, 
if there are genes and we can identify those, those th that's essentially that you have other genes, not this particular one, but other genes that make that somehow protect you. So these this idea of mutations that are good for you, that are health, that are good for your health, uh, is, is a relatively new idea. There are a few cases of infectious diseases where those have been found, but to be able to find this, uh, you know, in a neurodegenerative disease is just remarkable. And 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 it is true. It's partly because of the, mainly, sorry, because of this massive. Uh, um, thousands of people who are related to each other. By the way, I hope it was obvious, it's Columbia, South America, not Columbia University, obviously, uh, in South America that, that, uh, that, that we're able to identify these and, and the, the wonderful work of Nick and this team and, and their team members. So I just, um, I, I'm terribly exciting about this. We're really looking forward to seeing if we can find something that would be useful for helping to develop. Uh, treatments, even slowing the disease down is a big deal, maybe even uh, more than that. Okay, so so thank you to the three of you. Very nicely done. And uh, thank you for being on time, uh, even with my interruptions. Um, and uh, so I'm going to open it now to uh, Q&A or, or anything that you want to discuss. And I think, um, let me, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can um, so that I can, uh, hold on a minute. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, and then go back to the stop share. And then, okay, so there, we haven't seen any questions in Q&A, but we may have in, oh, we have in chat, okay. Look so in the chat window, yeah. Okay, I've got it open. Um, All right. So um, Elizabeth, why don't I try to, um, to, to lead, uh, not me answering these, but uh, I, I, there are a couple I can answer. Um, uh, definitely. Have you considered studying stiff person syndrome? And the answer and for me is no, because uh, it must be a very rare one. I'm not sure. Rick, I could, I could, I, I could yeah, chime in right. there. I was going to say somebody might know. Yeah. So I, I remember hearing about this before. So I, I, I must confess that during Lindsay's presentation, I was looking up the specifics of stiff person syndrome. It's okay. I've heard Lindsay talk before. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's it's interesting. So it's it's thought to be an autoimmune disease. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, which, you know, immunology is its own separate branch, and we're no means experts in immunology, but we have employed a technology. It's at one of the Hudson Alpha's resident companies from iRepertory, which uses genomics, which of course we do understand very well, to uh, examine the uh, the immune system. Uh, and as far as I can tell, just from a quick perusal, that. The exact mechanism within autoimmunity is not understood for stiff person syndrome. However, I, I will say the big challenge there would be that its incidence in the United States is about one in a million people. So that means that gathering patient samples for that would be very difficult um, and likely something that would probably really need to be done at a major medical school that could get their hands on enough uh, patient samples to really do something meaningful. Yeah, and, and uh, I, it may be obvious, uh, all of these studies, well, not the studies where we're looking for genes, that, like the way that Nick talked about, we actually need large numbers uh, uh, in order to, two or three samples don't help. Now, what Lindsay talked about, we can have a modest number of those and learn a lot from them. Uh, but from, from when we're looking for genes, I mean, and, and for biomarkers, by the way, and, and actually the biomarker projects that you'll hear about next time, because I, I, I want to, uh, it, it would take too long. Uh, we literally need hundreds of those. And that's, that's been the hardest part of, of, of doing that kind of collection. We need uh, plasma, the, the clear part of blood that's really, really, really well prepared. So, um, uh, and so that takes a lot of resources to do that. But it, and when Brian said a big medical school, really what he means is probably 10 or 20 big medical schools working together because it's going to be really hard to find something that rare. Doesn't mean we, we should say no to it. Or, and and I, I, I hope you all know we care about common disease and rare disease. We do lots on diseases uh, in childhood, especially, but adults, both in our clinic and, uh, uh, and in some research, uh, literally hundreds, often kids, but some, a lot of adults as well. Let me go on to the next one. Um, will we share a copy of the deck? Yeah, we can figure out a way. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, what we'll work on on showing those slides. I don't think anything is proprietary in those slides in terms of that we took them from somebody else and 
And uh, so we'll, we'll be, me, meaning we're, we're happy to share. The and we're also recording this, this event and we will send that out in a follow-up email to everyone who participated. So they'll get this recording. Yeah, and that actually might be easier because you can hear the explanation of the slides while you're looking at them and go back and forth. So, um, okay. Um, essential tremors. Oh, okay. So, uh, and you know, Parkinson is one that you get tremors in Huntington's other diseases. Well, Parkinson's in particular, my, my father uh, had Parkinson's disease and I know, that, and we know lots, it's a, a lot more common than Huntington and ALS, for instance. But um, uh, so there's essential tremor and do anyone, any of you want to want to pick that answer up about what we know about that? Nick, is that you? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. So there's not a lot known about essential tremor um, genetics. And, uh, you know, it's, that's our area of expertise. There's, there's a little bit known and, and it is known to run in families, but many times when it runs in families, there's not an identifiable cause. Um, now, one thing that's tricky about essential tremor, and this um, uh, applies to things like stiff person syndrome as well, um, is that, um, you know, it can be rare, like some, like stiff person syndrome or something very common, like a central tremor. Um, but anytime that there's a difficulty in nailing down um, the, the phenotype, that's a difficulty for geneticists. And um, what I mean by that is that, um, you know, a central tremor, it, it's, it's different from Parkinson's, but oftentimes that's a differential. And sometimes it's not clear on um, a neurology evaluation. Um, there can also be lots of environmental causes of um, a central tremor. Um, and other um, you know, causes of tremor that are not essential tremor that may be diagnosed. Um, you know, so so uh, there can be you know, forms of um, a central tremor that are very severe, um, but of course there, there are also um, milder forms. And so it, anytime that there's that kind of spectrum, um, it's, it's difficult um, for geneticists to find associations um, unless there's a, a strongly affected family, and in which case there, that has uh, been the case for, for a couple of um, essential tremor genes, but, but not generally for a lot. Um, and, so, uh, and usually you need um, multiple families if you're going to do it, or at least a bit like the, the, the Columbia one is a very, very large family of 5,000 known affected. They don't know that they're family, but they're all related to each other, we know. So, so uh, and that's part of the problem, and you might have because usually one family is not going to be enough to find. Sometimes it can be, but usually it's not. Um, and Nick, uh, I, I know this just from experience, but also from talking with others, including a neurologist. Uh, a lot of times kids, for instance, will have a central tremor and it just goes away. I mean, they'll have it for you know, a little while and it just goes away, maybe in adults as well, but I know that happens as well. Um, let me move on because there's there are two or three others. and. Um, uh, let's see, um, are there commonalities, but, oh, this is one for Nick, early onset and, and later onset, how they're related to each other. Very, very helpful, very good question. Yes, so um, the answer is that they are way more related than you may imagine. Um, so you would think that with this, um, you know, difference in 25 years, say, between the disease that I described that's very early onset and runs in families, and then, um, sporadic late onset AD where um, there's not an identifiable cause, you would think that's got to be very different diseases. And, and there are differences um, and there can be different contributing factors for late onset Alzheimer's disease. But the underlying pathology, when you look at the brain and you look at how the underlying pathology spread is strikingly sim similar. There, there are several differences, um, a, a little bit more uh, cortical involvement early on for early onset. Um, but in general, um, it's, it's very, very similar. Um, which is one of the reasons why um, a, a lot of times as geneticists and scientists, we will um, use the familial um, genetic variants as a way to model disease in, say, mice or, or in cells, um, and it's still very informative for the late onset disease. Um, so one example of that, and um, Rick, I'm, I'm sorry, but this will feed into another question, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal it in that way a little bit, um, but uh, the mutations um, in early onset Alzheimer's disease are all um, related to processing of amyloid beta, which is one of the main pathologies in Alzheimer's disease. It's the thing that clumps up into aggregates um, called plaques. And um, those uh, mutations in familial Alzheimer's disease are not present in late onset Alzheimer's disease, yet you get these same plaques. Now, why does that matter? 
Well, the, the, the whole pathway was discovered because of early onset Alzheimer's disease mutations. Um, and because of that, um, we were able to develop um, antibody treatments against amyloid beta. Um, so uh, that's uh, treatments such as the recently approved um, drug aducanumab. Um, and there, there are other monoclonal um, antibody treatments that have been in clinical trials and then some that are still are in clinical trials. Um, now, there is another question, and we talked about this um, early on, so I, I think I can, Rick, can I go ahead and take some liberty with, with answering this a little bit? Yeah. So um, what I'll say is that, you know, each oh, of no, us hold on. are- I don't know the question. Yeah. The question is, because they don't see it, uh, any comments on the new Alzheimer's drug recently approved? And it's- Right. That's what he's about yeah. to talk about. So just- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. So I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. I forget the um, participants can't see the question. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so- um, all of us have different opinions as scientists on the on the drug, but you may have seen um, that it's controversial. Well, why is it controversial? It's it's a new treatment for Alzheimer's disease. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Um, and of course, um, we we are excited about moving the ball forward. Um, what scientists are concerned about, and so I'll speak in aggregate for the field, and then I'll also point to a, a resource um, that uh, that can help you see some of the opinions from lots of people all around the country. I, I can put that into the, the chat window. Um, but uh, what people are concerned about is this. There were two phase three clinical trials. One showed a modest effect. The other did not show an effect and was actually halted early because um, of what's called a futility analysis. Um, it turns out they should not have halted it early because of a futility analysis, because as data continue to come in, um, they did see some modest effects. Um, however, um, the, the, this is why there was such a delay in the FDA um, trying to decide whether to approve this was because of this um, abnormality in the trialing process. And the FDA has said they're going to require what's called a phase four clinical trial, where they will evaluate this um, in individuals who are treated. What I'll say is that what the data says is that the earlier we treat these diseases, the better the outcome is going to be. And these trials were um, slated for the earliest um, possible onset, so people who have just presented to the neurologist with, with mild, very mild symptoms. For those individuals, this treatment may have a modest effect, um, you know, something like a 20% slowing probably, maybe, maybe 30% at best, um, on the disease course. That's not nothing, and it's something that if you're a patient, you're going to be excited about, um, but it's definitely not uh, a cure. The other thing is that um, these uh, is the individuals with mild to severe Alzheimer's disease likely will not see any statistical benefit um, in aggregate from this drug. And that's another thing that folks are concerned about because it's, there's no stipulations on the, on the approval. So um, what I'll do is I'll send a link to an article on a, on a website called All's Forum where you can read um, opinions by lots of different scientists um, in the field on, uh, on this topic. So Liz, I think you may have to, that if he puts that in the chat, Folks won't see it, I don't believe. So you, somehow we need to get that to them. So um, we can do that some other way. But go ahead and put it in, Nick, I think, just in case. Yeah. So, I think you, so, said, you can address it to the panelists and attendees, and they should be able to see it, Nick. Oh, I see. There's a different. Yeah, I did it just okay. now, so I think it should be available. Now. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, by the way, um, uh, maybe, maybe this wasn't obvious. The biomarker tests that we're trying to develop, that would help a whole lot in this because you if you could detect symptoms very early or even before, you could detect that somebody's having onset even before symptoms, then and that's one of the main reasons for, one of the main reasons for having biomarkers is that then you could start treating earlier. And we, this is probably true for practically every disease. Certainly cancer, you treat earlier, uh, these as well. So that's, that's partly why we're doing this tripartite, and now actually I forgot to tell you the fourth approach, I'll tell you right at the end that we're just starting, so. Okay, um, let, we're getting low on time, so let me, um, actually, I, I, I think we should address this. Do we need local donors, and if so, what type? And the, the answer is, um, in general, it's hard for us to do that, not because uh, we certainly, have clinic, we have a clinic, we have ways of doing this. We also do a lot of work with, with the neurology clinic at, at, at University of Alabama and Birmingham Medical School. Uh, but for these big genetic studies, uh, we, we actually, it's too hard for us to be able to use a handful because 
they they you have to have them fit in with the larger population. That sounds pretty lame, I, I realize, and it doesn't mean go away. We don't mean that at all. But I think what we'll probably Nick, you are more experienced in this than than the rest of us in terms of uh, and, and not to mention the the way that we have done some stuff in the clinic. Our clinic specializes in rare unexplained diseases, but we do have uh, have done some some. Uh, uh, with neurodegenerative diseases that, that uh, and I think maybe the best way to do that is let us know, let Liz or Elizabeth know. And then we, I think what we need to do is to start working on whether, how we could do something like that. We appreciate, and, and I realize that we've had so many people we know who really want to help uh, and, and, and we're not shunning you at all. We just need to make sure that it, that, that we don't, uh, mislead you first of all, and secondly, that we actually can do something good with it. Nick, do you have right? And, and Rick is to, to clarify talking about donors of samples, like blood samples. I oh, believe yeah, yeah. Sorry, the way sorry. you were interpreting the question, yeah, right? Yeah, we're not asking you to give us your brains. Not, that's not what we think, mean. Mean, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, now we do want now. If you want other kinds, if you're talking about the kind of donor that Liz is, Elizabeth is going to talk about in a minute. Yes, we need lots of those. I'm, I'm, I'm making a joke. Um, so, um, all right. Um, oh, yes. L Lindsay pointed out there's something, a, a, a giant national study called All of Us uh, that uh, uh, Sean Levy, who's part of Hudson Alpha, is part of, we've been part of, uh, and, and um, they're basically, I think it's a million people, and they may be trying to get larger, more than a million people collecting for not for any one particular disease, but where they're part of a, a study. And, and actually, it, it, are there hyphens in all of us? I don't think it's just called all of us, a capital A and capital U. Look that up. Danny, Danny may be able to say something to about that. Danny, I just saw that you joined. Uh, but, but you can, you can uh, contribute to that in general. That has to do with, and I'm pretty sure the collection sites they're all over the country. I know one's in Birmingham. I don't know if we're doing any of the collection too. And then some of the, a lot of the sequencing for that is being done on the Hudson Alpha campus too. Lin Lindsay just uh, posted to all of to every uh, to all of us on here uh, the the website. So please look at that. That's actually a really interesting project to look at as well. All right, I'm I'm gonna uh, do executive privilege here and almost stop. I have one more thing to add that I was gonna put on my first slide, and it's a teaser. We are just starting a new project. We haven't really, well, we've done one little thing, just starting to do an another project with some uh, close friends and colleagues. It's actually a large number of scientists all over the country and in a couple of other countries, but especially at UC San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco. And it's a new approach, unrelated to beta amyloid and the various things, a new approach to try to develop uh, a class of drugs uh, for all neurodegenerative diseases. And we're terribly excited about this. You see, we have to take multiple approaches. We're not spread thin, don't worry about that. That's not what's happening. We have a lot of expertise that they can use and they wanna work with us. And so we can't announce it yet because we're not even sure how it will work. Uh, it's not secret in terms of what the, the project is, but this would require a whole meeting. So. We'll try to do this instead of once a year, we'll do this twice a year or something like this, but we'll certainly try to keep you all uh, posted on that. Uh, and especially once we get moving on and start getting results. So uh, I, I will stop there and pass it back to Elizabeth uh, who has some closing words to say. Well, thank you, Rick. And uh, thank you all of our, our wonderful scientists, Brian, Nick, and Lindsay for making time um, to share this great information. And um, Rick, we'll, we'll take you up on that offer and we'll do this again soon. We won't wait a whole nother year um, to do another update. Um, thank you everyone who joined us tonight. Many of you have already made a gift to support the Memory Mobility Program. Um, just from this event alone, we've raised almost $1,000. Um, if you are inspired, I hope you are, by the, the wonderful things that you've heard tonight and the, and the work that's going on um, at Hudson Alpha in neurodegenerative disease um, and, and other types of research, please consider making a gift to the Memory and Mobility Program. Um, I'm going to, uh, there, I just added it. There is a link to how you can go online and make a gift to the Memory Mobility Program. 
Um, you can always mail a check to the Hudson Alpha Foundation at 601 Genome Way, and I'll put that on there in just a second as well. Um, we thank you so much. We couldn't do what we do. You heard what Nick said. Um, the, the entire Escapers project was funded through philanthropy. So um, it means a lot to us. And um, we look forward to connecting with you in person again very soon and having you on the Hudson Alpha campus. Yes, we're all nodding our heads to that. So um, any closing comments from, uh, from everybody on the panel? I think just thanks so much for uh, having us and, and listening to the work that we've done. We, we really couldn't do what we do without you guys. So we really appreciate uh, you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and thank you again for the donations you've already made. And we hope to uh, uh, continue seeing support. This uh, really believe we are doing good things with this and we're being good stewards of this, uh, of the funds that you donate and, uh, and really are making progress. So stay tuned. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. You'll get the recording of this in an email shortly, probably tomorrow or the day after. We appreciate